when I was in therapy, I found that um, when I would work on an issue, a defense that I had erected as a child to protect me would not be uh, easily persuaded to go away simply by me saying, I don't need this defense anymore because my father is no longer here. And what was a, a, a useful metaphor for me, and I don't know if it's a metaphor or not, but it, it was a useful metaphor at the very least, was to perceive these uh, defense mechanisms that I had erected as a child that made perfect sense when I was a child, to perceive them as living beings with their own uh, will to live. And so I could say to myself, you know, I don't need this anymore. And it, it, it wouldn't matter. They would fight for their lives. And, you know, I was able to do some, some talking sometimes to them and say, you know, thank you for your service. And, you know, you can retire and it didn't really work. And then I would say, so I tell you what, you can still be on guard. It's just, you don't need to always be jumping up all the time. You can, you can rest, but you'll still be here in case I ever need you. And that helped. But the point is that was a, that was a decade long process. And this, by the way, is also one of the reasons that I, I, I don't believe that, that I have a hard time believing that a culture can undergo a voluntary transformation is if it took me 10 years of solid work to do that, of attending to and trying to talk to one of every one of these defense mechanisms, some of, some of whom listened and some of whom did not, and some of whom fought very hard and some of whom are still there. And some of whom I haven't even acknowledged because they're so, I've become so much a part of me that if that can happen on a personal level, how much more difficult is this to happen? Is it for this to happen on, on a larger social scale? Because we certainly have defense mechanisms in place on a social scale that I, I, I've, I've, you know, I've often quoted R.D. Lang's Three Rules of a Dysfunctional Family, which are also Three Rules of a Dysfunctional Culture, and Rule A is don't, and Rule A1 is Rule A does not exist, and Rule A2 is never discussed existence or non-existence rules, A, A1, or A2. And we have those at the, at the, the larger level that, you know, it is forbidden to speak of, you know, somebody wrote to me the other day and said, that they don't know of any other, they don't know of very many other writers who so adamantly put the natural world first in their writing. And I mean, I'm very clear at every second that the world is more important than this economic system. And even among environmentalists, that is fairly rare. And And that's, that's, that is one of those things that we can never speak about in this culture is the fact that the world is more important than the economic system. And the, the point is that's one of those, that there are defense mechanisms in place that if you even speak of that, then I didn't hear what you said. You didn't, you may as well have been quacking like a duck. And so I think it's often useful, and again, I, I don't know if this is a metaphor, if this is true, but not only are defense mechanisms, I believe, at least metaphorically living beings, but also I, we can look at cultures as living beings. 
and a culture that, that doesn't want to die, even when this culture is killing everything that lives, this particular culture. And You know, I don't know, I don't know what, I know on a personal level how I was able to use that understanding or to use that metaphor in order to help myself become more present rather than to be ruled by defense mechanisms at all times. But I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to talk to a whole culture and say, you know, I understand that, you know, you are terribly afraid of the real world and you perceive the world as terribly scary. And so that's why you have to create all of these barriers and you have to create this sense of superiority because, because you are afraid of death and because you're afraid of the fact that you like everyone else will die. And so you have to create this entire edifice. You have to try to control everything because ultimately you cannot control your own life and death. And I can say that to myself and I can say that to individuals, but, and I can try to say it to a whole culture by writing in the past two weeks, I've interviewed three different longtime activists. Two of them were Paul Ehrlich, who's been writing since the sixties. Another one was B2 Saigal, who, has been doing his fabulous work in India since the seventies and both they and myself and the other person I was talking to were all saying, you know, I've been working on this for decades and everything's getting worse. And, you know, of course that's not a reason to quit. I'm, I, I just despise the people who say things are getting worse. So party or simply build a lifeboat or whatever. But I think we also have to recognize how fierce the momentum is. And I think, I think this culture will, will run itself to the very end in part because it too wants to do what it perceives as living. It wants to continue. And of course, just because something wants to continue doesn't mean that it should. Um, just because Ted Bundy didn't want to die doesn't mean that he should be allowed to live. And when this culture is killing the planet, it needs it, the culture itself needs to die. Since every defense mechanism is in this metaphor um, or in reality, however it works, a living being, and since it is its own being, every defense mechanism has to be approached differently according to those circumstances. But here's what I know is that if you don't acknowledge the existence of these defense mechanisms, then you can't approach them in the first place and you can't attempt to move past them. It's like the doctor friend of mine says, correct diagnosis is a first step toward proper treatment. And it's the same on the larger social scale. That the first thing we have to do is to recognize that this culture is based on control, which is based on fear. And this culture is attempting to control everything. And that's one reason it turns the entire planet into parking lots is because it's easier to control a parking lot than it is a living forest. It's easier to control a dead ocean than a living ocean. And if we can't acknowledge the roots of these problems, and if we can't acknowledge the defense mechanisms that lead to them in the first place, except I don't want to use the word defense mechanism because that implies the opposite of a living being. If we can't acknowledge these
these urges and even personality traits that have been inculcated into us, inculcate comes from the root inculcare, to stamp in with the heel, that have been stamped into us, stamped into us so deeply that they have become who we think we are. If we can't acknowledge that these have been stamped into us, and if we can't acknowledge what they are doing to us and to everyone else, then we can't do anything about them. So the first step, is to, you know, if you're in a really shitty relationship, the first step is to really look at your partner and to really look at yourself and really look at the relationship. You know, we often think about a relationship. I've always hated that Who song that has the line, one and one don't make two, one and one makes one. Actually, one and one in a relationship makes three because you got you, you got me, and you got us, you got three, three people here. And if, if, if it's going poorly, if it is destructive, then you need to look at each part of that triangle and all of the lines in between them. And, and one would think that when 200 species are going extinct today, and one would think when they're talking blithely of the collapse of the Antarctic ice sheets, when they're talking blithely about the death of the oceans, that we would start to examine these beings who have been inculcated into each of us. <laughs>